First, let's talk about two before exam period. One, find someone else to study with. Even if you are someone who is not a group work person, and a lot of you aren't, I was not, it really helps to see what's going on in someone else's brain with the material that you're learning. And if you feel as though something's not working, that's fine. You guys are grown ups. You can, you can decide that you're going to change who it is you're working with. And I think everyone can be OK with that. But it's important to try to work with other people on this, because they will see things that you don't, and vice versa. Take practice exams, as Dean Dugas suggested. Taking practice exams is a huge part of practicing, just the same as you took practice LSATs before you took the, the LSAT. Um, take them under time conditions, write an exam, see what that's going to be like. Um, mix it up a little bit. If you've got spare practice exams that a professor posted for you, go through them with your study group, just spotting the issues, seeing what everyone can see. They don't all have to be timed formal events. It's good if some are, but you can also play around with it a little bit. Then during exams, a couple, a couple points. One would be, when you get an exam, read the question. You will have this temptation to start typing immediately. And there will be some reason for that. You could type the entire time of the exam and still have more to say. But the quality of what you say will be better if you slow down, read, and figure out what's being asked of you, and take some time to outline your answer before you start. And the last thing is, give your brain a rest during exam period. That means a few things. Sleep, definitely get sleep. Sleep is great rest for your brain. Exercise, if you're an exercise person. I wouldn't take up cross-country skiing during uh, exam period. But whatever it is that you do for physical uh, stuff, do, keep doing it. And, and spend some time, just the same as they say, to take your eyes off of your computer screen every now and then to give your eyes a break. Give your brain a break. If it's playing Sudoku or doing a crossword puzzle or just vegging a little bit, your brain can't do all exams all the time. So, so be sure to give your brain a rest along the way. You guys will do great. I'll be here to answer questions. Good luck. I'm Charles Bars, and I teach torts, and some of my advice might be uh, informed by that. Uh, I also have basically four, <laughs> four uh, little bits, also two in terms of preparation, two in terms of uh, during the exam. Apparently, torts teachers think alike. Um, I first want to underscore um, precisely what uh, Professor Kendrick said about importance of studying in groups. That's something I did not do in law school, and I think it would have been better had I done that. Uh, the second thing is to definitely write your own outlines. I'm always very uh, liberal in, in allowing students to bring in whatever outlines written by whomever uh, into their class if they want to, into the exam, because it doesn't do you any good, really. I mean, it's, there's a certain amount of utility in having it all down in one place. But the value of, of an outline that you hear lots about is the process of writing one. It is the process of writing one that forces you to conceptualize the doctrines you've learned into a kind of overall scheme and to see the relationships uh, uh, among the different doctrines. Um, so that's uh, two, two things for preparation. In terms of taking the exam itself, um, uh, the, the main one, the big one, well, I guess I would underscore what Professor Kendrick said, which is um, to, um, uh, to read the question. In fact, you might read the question slowly. In fact, you might even read the question twice uh, to make sure that you catch all the issues. Because if you miss a big issue, that can, that can really be a problem for your exam. And the second thing, and again, this is particularly important for torts, but I think it's generalizable, which is uh, pay attention to and use the facts. That is the most important thing. I mean, Dean Dugas just alluded to this a minute ago when he said, you're giving you a new set of facts that cannot emphasize enough the importance of using the facts that are given to you in the fact pattern. The little uh, kind of um, heuristic that I always tell my students is be careful of the word if. Oftentimes what I see on exams is someone saying if the defendant, uh, you know, if the, if the plaintiff can show that the type of accident is not the kind of thing that happens uh, absent at negligence, then they will have a, a claim of res ipsa loquitur or something. That is just a reformulation of the rule itself and gets you zero credit from when I grade exams. Uh, you can always restate any rule by saying, by phrasing it into terms of an if-then clause. And it makes you feel like you're applying facts in some way. 
but you're not giving us any new information at all showing you that you've understood the language. Instead, use the word because whenever you possibly can. Whenever you're saying something, it make, uh, it, it force yourself to say, what's the reason for it? It's because so and su such and such. Uh, that'll avoid, that'll help you avoid the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the fate of what, uh, what law professors tend to call conclusory answers. Statements that are basically just paraphrasing or summary descriptions of the law without showing us how they really apply to the particular facts at hand. So that's the most important thing, and I think I'll leave it there. So hi, uh, my name is Toby Heitens. I teach Civ Pro. Um, Charles just stole my because, so I'm going to restate it. Um, this is the single biggest difference between exams that are really, really good and exams that are not really, really good. Uh, I'm going to try to use another example to lodge this into your mind. Uh, the most useful piece of marital advice I ever received is that you should always envision your spouse as having a tattoo across their forehead that says the words, I cannot read your mind. I do not know what you were thinking right now. I cannot read your mind. And the same thing is true uh, times 10 for the people who grade your exams. I do not know why you think something unless you tell me why you think that. So you should not write any statement on an exam without imagining what if someone says, why is that? And I think partly people often assume things are obvious. So Charles, you know, so there's a, a couple series of examples. Charles is absolutely right. The first mistake is the if mistake. The second mistake is just to list a bunch of facts from the question and then to assert that the answer is X. That is also no better. That is just giving me the rule and then listing the facts of my own question back at me and insisting that obviously the answer is X. You need to explain why you think those facts mean that the answer is X. Um, and err, I would err extremely on the side of really, really, really explicitly setting forth your reasoning of why you think those facts mean the answer is X, even if it's at the risk of making something that you think is incredibly obvious. Don't assume it's incredibly obvious. Spell out your reasoning. If you think, if there's a sort of a part of your mental thought process that you go through in analyzing the question, write those things down so the person can see how you're walking through it. So that's my first point. The second one, um, I'm a big believer, this, and some might disagree with me here, I'm a big believer in the use of magic words on an exam. The other place people constantly get into trouble is that they try to paraphrase magic words. They try to paraphrase important words from the course. So in Civ Pro, they paraphrase citizenship as residency, but citizenship is not the same thing as residency. And they paraphrase, they para people paraphrase important legal concepts all the time in an exam. And I'll just say this, if you're enough of an expert, you can get away with paraphrasing important legal concepts. I don't think fall semester of 1L year on an exam is a time to try to paraphrase important legal concepts. If there is a magic word, use the magic word. Because A, it shows that you know what the magic word is. And B, it decreases the risk that in attempting to paraphrase the magic word, you will actually paraphrase it in a way that is incorrect, which happens a lot. So those are the two advices, because magic words. Thanks. I'll be around. Hi, I'm George Cohen. I teach contracts, uh, and I think uh, a lot of what I, I'm going to say complements what, what has already been said, but I'll say it in a somewhat different way because people process things in different way. Uh, so you're all used to uh, the IRAC method, uh, the, 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 the structure of, of, of things, that uh, uh, the way, way to make arguments and everything. I want to kind of reformulate that into a kind of um, acronym of things that, that I look for in exams, and I imagine my colleagues look for similar kinds of things as well. And the acronym I like to use is COGI, C-O-J-I. Uh, and that stands for the following four things, competence, organization, judgment, and imagination. So those are the things that I'm looking for on an exam, and I think that those are things that are, you know, complementary, as I said, to people, what people have said already. So by competence, that's what most people think of as what we're testing. That is, you know, do you know the rules? Do you understand how the concepts of the course work, and can you sort of articulate those in a, in a meaningful way? Uh, so, but that's only one part of what we're looking for. Uh, we're also looking for organization. That is, can you structure these things using the facts of the uh, of the question in a kind of organized way that creates an argument that kind of flows logically where one thing uh, follows another and you're you're making supporting statements for the kinds of things you want to you want to say so the organization part is really important because you can understand all the concepts you can understand the facts but if you can't put it in a kind of structured form that that reads well and and follows logically you're not going to get as much credit for that 
The judgment part is also something that's important, and uh, I don't think this has really been mentioned as much or, or focused as much on yet, uh, but it's very important to me, and that is part of what we're testing is your ability to decide. I mean, we, we talk about issue spotting and, and things of that sort, but part of what we're testing is the ability to make judgments about what's important and what's not important, because in every question, there will be facts that are more important than others. There will be legal issues that are more important than others, you know, and the fact that you, you know, spent all your time studying Erie or something, and you know, you know there's an Erie question in there somewhere, doesn't mean that it's an Erie question. It, it may be something else. You have to answer the question that's being asked, and, and we're, we're trying to examine uh, in terms of testing you on what kind of lawyer would be, uh, because lawyers have to make these kinds of decisions. You have to make judgments about which are the things that are more important and which are the things that are less important, and you need to spend more of your time on the things that are more important, the issues that are more important in the question. If it's not a consideration, question, if that's an easy part of the question, do a sentence on it and then get off it and go on to something else. Spend more of your time on where the meat of the question is because that's where you're going to get more points and more, more credit for it. And then finally, imagination. Uh, the idea here is that, that a lot of times we're going to be asking you questions about uh, fact patterns uh, that you haven't really seen before or uh, situations you haven't seen before. And it's not meant to trick you. Uh, it is meant to sort of see, well, uh, you've learned certain kinds concepts in the course, can you extend what you've learned to an unfamiliar situation? And that, I think, I view that as an act of imagination. Uh, you can call it analogy, you can call it other kinds of things, but it's can you take the ideas, the theories, the concepts, the vocabulary that you've learned and make sense of a difficult, complicated, messy, factual situation. So competence, organization, judgment, and imagination, COGI is the acronym that I uh, think that people should, should think about in terms of what we're looking for on an exam. The fifth thing that I would say, um, and again, this, this, this also complements what, what people have said already, uh, but I would say it this way, um, everything you say in an exam should be in the service of a legal argument. That is, you should spend, in, at least in my view, others may disagree, you should spend no time summarizing facts or summarizing legal principles. Everything you should do is in the service of a legal argument. And when you outline, you should outline in arguments to the extent that you can, as opposed to just topic headings. Um, you want to say, OK, who is going to be making what argument about this legal point? Because that will help you think about, OK, well, which facts are relevant to that? Which doctrines do I need to focus on to answer that point? So you always always want to be thinking about what's my argument now? What's the next argument I, I'm going to be making and how do these facts fit into that argument? I'm happy to talk uh, also after the session's over. Thanks. My name is uh, George Geis. I teach the first year uh, contracts class. Um, I maybe have been spending too much time uh, hanging out with my uh, teenage kids, but I've tried to think about how to turn studying for your uh, final exams into something like a game where, you know, you actually can approach it uh, like you would some sort of a major uh, competition or challenge. And so I thought maybe the, the most helpful piece of advice would be um, uh, how I would approach a, a, an exam, although I want to emphasize that lots of different uh, people will approach exams in really different ways, and there's no one right way to uh, approach or to study uh, for your test. You've already heard some, some different emphases here. Um, but I like to think that no matter how complicated a class is, at some level, there's only so much time that takes place in a semester such that part of your trick where you, you know, are right now is to figure out a way to distill the major thoughts or concepts of the class into the key 30 or 40 or 50 different ideas and concepts and issues that you've talked about and learned so far in each of your course. And so once you've you know, figured out what are those major issues, I think the game is really how do you take those 30 or 40, 50 issues and line them up on one side and then think about the different questions that you're presented with on the exam and line them up across the top and figure out you know, the footprint of what your exam answer should look like in a way that you're actually identifying the major issues for each question um, based on that, that full list of 30 or 40 or 50 things that you've talked about. And the mistakes that students sometimes make are, are, are kind of the obvious ones, and you've probably heard about this. One mistake is that you start putting a check in every single box for every single concept, and you start talking about everything you've learned in the class for each of the questions. And you're going to run out of time if you do that. You're not going to get a great answer. 
The second problem that you might make is that you start uh, missing things. You think, well, here's the answer and here's why, and then you stop, but there are really two or three or four other major concepts from the class that are implicated by the question, and um, you should have addressed those in order to get full credit for the, for the answers. Um, and then finally, the, the third mistake that I think sometimes people make relates to what George said a minute ago in judgment and recognizing which are the issues on the question that actually deserve a lot of emphasis and a lot of analysis because they're close, and which are the issues on the, on the test that are pretty straightforward. And if it's an easy answer and you know it's right, just say that's the answer and don't spend a lot of time you know, hemming and hawing about, well, it could be this and it could be that. Now, the hard part, I think, about uh, doing well on exams is knowing when you get those difficult questions and, and when is something really merit greater analysis. Um, and I think that's what I call the art and science of, of taking exams. I think practice will help you figure that out. And a lot of it is just trying to figure out why is each sentence in this exam? And, and I think sometimes going back after you've gotten a basic outline of your answer and asking that question can be helpful. I'll tell you, I only put a sentence. Every, every Every sentence in my exam is in there for one of three reasons. First, I'm trying to arm you with some piece of information that's related to an important part of a question. Right? It's a fact that's going to you know, help you sway one way or the other. Second, I'm trying to put in a red herring to see if you're going to fall for a trick. And third, I'm trying to be funny. It's one of those three things. And so you could go sentence by sentence, I think, and try to figure out which one it is. And by the end of the day, hopefully, you know, taking apart a test like that will be helpful as you get that, that ultimate pattern footprint for the exam. I'm Caleb Nelson. I teach civil procedure here. My tips are all about taking exams rather than studying for them. And I think many of my tips relate to things people have already said, as you might expect. But my first tip relates to the idea that you should read each question carefully, which is absolutely right. You should also do what the question is asking you to do. So after you've read the question, answer the question. Do what the question is asking you to do. You'll get lots of different questions on law school exams, different types of questions. So some exams will ask you, you know, here's this big long fact pattern, analyze every single issue that you spot in this fact pattern. Other questions will focus your attention on specific issues. They'll ask you, what's the right answer to this particular question? Those are two very different questions, even if they happen to involve the same facts. And the questions call for different sorts of answers. You don't want to give the, you know, every single issue in the course answer to the specific question that's asking you to focus on one particular issue. So you want to do what the question is asking you to do. A second thing, lots of exam questions ask you to apply the law that you've learned to some new facts, as people have been saying. When you're responding to questions like that, I think students often make equal and opposite mistakes. Some students, like Professor Heidens was saying, just recite back the facts that they've been given and then tell you their bottom line conclusion. Other students have a lot of general statements of law that they could have written before they even knew what the question was. They have paragraph after paragraph that's just, you know, this summary of this case that we studied and this summary of this case that we studied, but that don't really apply the law to the facts. Your goal is to hit the sweet spot in the middle. You want to show the professor that you understand the legal rules and legal doctrines that you've studied, but you want to do so by applying those legal rules and legal doctrines to the specific facts that you're being asked about. That's the sort of legal analysis that you should be doing, applying the general principles of law that you've learned to the specific facts that you're being asked about. Remember, as Professor Hayden said, that for a lot of questions, for most questions, you're being graded on your reasoning rather than on the specific conclusion that you reach. Of course, the conclusion does need to make sense, but your essay should explain how you got there. You want to build an argument step by step with appropriate references to authorities that support the steps, that answer the, you know, why do you say that question that Professor Hayden was talking about. Here's a more specific tip that's related to that last point point. Exam questions often involve facts that are variations on cases that you studied or that lie at the border between, say, two precedents that you studied in the, case, in the course. If you get a question like that, you should certainly make clear to the professor that you understand, you know, this is the case that this question is modeled on, right? This is the relevant precedent or these are the two relevant precedents. You should also make clear that you understand both the similarities of the fact pattern to the facts of those cases and the differences of the fact 
fact pattern to the facts of those cases, and why the similarities or differences might matter given the legal reasoning that the cases that you studied used. Right? Why is this difference in the facts relevant given the rationale of a case? Right? That, so your legal analysis should pay attention not only to the kind of black letter legal doctrine, you know, the one sentence summary of the holding of a particular case, but also to the facts of that case and how the facts of that case might relate to the new facts that you're being asked to analyze. Remember also that lawyers need to know the difference between questions that have clear answers and questions that different courts might have different answers to, questions that the courts might disagree about. That knowledge, the ability to, d to distinguish between questions that have a clear answer and questions where different people might say different things, that knowledge is part of what clients pay lawyers for, and it's part of what many exams are designed to test. To the extent that a question asks you to talk about a whole bunch of different issues presented by a fact pattern, some of those issues are going to have clear answers that you can say and move on. Others are going to call for more analysis. Different people could come out different ways on this, there's more to talk about here. If you're addressing a question in a gray zone, whether it's part of a big fact pattern or a specific question, don't pretend that it has a clear answer. Right? Don't exaggerate the strength of the argument for your conclusion. If there's something to be said on the other side, your professor is going to want to know that you recognize that there's something to be said on the other side and is going to want you to talk about why, even though there's this other thing to be said on the other side, here's how you would analyze it. Here's how you respond to this objection. Right? So don't pretend that questions in a gray zone have more determinate answers than they in fact do have. Your professor will be impressed to the extent you anticipate objections to your argument and explain why even though there's something to be said on the other side, here's why you think you've reached the conclusion that you've reached. I will give you a bonus tip. Always ask yourself why your professor has asked the question that appears on the exam. Try to psychoanalyze your professor. What is this question designed to test? In each course, the questions that your professor is asking probably have some relationship to the stuff that you covered in the course, right? So you want, to, you want to think about how the question relates to the material that you've covered. Also, the length of time that the professor allocates to a particular question can be a tip-off to the complexity of the issues that the question raises. If you think that a question has a really simple answer, but an hour and a half has been allocated to it, maybe your professor is just trying to put pressure on you to you know, have the courage of your convictions, but you should think pretty carefully before you give just you know the one sentence answer this is really easy there's nothing to be said on the other side i'm happy like other other people we, we haven't yet had a professor who is not willing to stick around and answer questions i'm not going to be the first but i'm happy to talk with people